Jake, is this a, is this a good time to be a, a, an international climate policy director in the USA? Are you, are you on sort of uh, firmer ground than you were maybe a few years ago when uh, brickbats were flying everywhere else? What's, what difference has the recent Obama administration's national climate plan policy made for, for the sort of US moving forward? I mean, it's clearly changed the dynamic. It's clearly changed the dynamic. Uh, you now have a president who has committed to uh, action and has laid out a plan to do that, and that has a really uh, powerful impact across the government agencies. And so, each of these government agencies are now implementing a set of measures um, under existing law that can be done without Congress, doesn't require any new act of legislation, and that can be done uh, by the time President Obama leaves office. And so that, I think, has, has changed the dynamic quite a bit. And, you know, it, it helps that we have a president who's made that sort of a priority, but it also helps you have a Secretary of State who is really driving the climate agenda on the international stage and really understands this kind of from his core being. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the big questions that everyone wants answered, and you probably don't know the uh, answer because may, maybe the decision hasn't been made, but what, what's, what's going to be reasonable for the US in terms of future uh, emission mitigation commitments? I think the current one is, what, 17% um, on 2005 levels by 2020. Are, are you getting the sense this is likely to be increased? I don't think that the 2020 number will be increased. I think, uh, you know, we might, uh, the U.S. might overachieve that target if it puts in place some of these measures, but I think in terms of sort of formally committing to increase that target, um, they just won't know that the target will be overcomplied until far enough in advance that they could, you know, change that number and have a meaningful impact. I think what is beginning, and you heard um, uh, Todd Stern say yesterday, is a serious conversation about what is the post-2020 target that the U.S. can put on the table. And, and I think, honestly, the only thing we can say right now is it'll be a bigger number than 17 percent, uh, you know, how much bigger it will be and whether or not that's contingent upon sort of additional congressional legislation or, or if it's going to be uh, based upon existing law. I mean, one thing that's important to keep in mind is many of the measures that uh, are in the Climate Action Plan do have a life beyond 2020. So mm -hmm. the car standard, which you know has doubled American fuel economy uh, in our vehicles, already has an end date of 2025 and could be sort of further ratcheted down beyond that. The power plant standards, which is the next big piece, uh, you know, we consistently have a ratchet down of power plant standards in the U.S. under the Clean Air Act. So um, NRDC's particular proposal does have uh, a, a provision that would ratchet down the targets over time, and, and we think that that's a piece that needs to be considered. So many of these existing laws are not just a 2020 and you're done, wash your hands and go away and we need something else. There is a set of additional measures that can kind of flow and, and you know, I think given the changing energy sector in the United States, which is energy efficiency and renewables, uh, you know, uh, taking a large role and obviously the, the dynamics in, uh, you know, coal, uh, there's a huge opportunity for the U.S. to go even farther in reducing its emissions and we hope that that's kind of a piece of what the U.S. puts on the table for, you know, the Paris Agreement. What, what level of engagement do you, do you see the USA taking in the construction of this, this global deal? Todd Stern um, has made a lot of comments in the past um, few months, like that. I guess, I guess the USA perhaps historically has had a, um, not the greatest reputation at these talks. It's, it's often been accused of uh, blocking or being difficult. What, what are you sensing when you, when you look at the delegation and you, and you hear people talking in the corridors? Is, is the USA, Team USA, really signed to make a difference or just at least take part more constructively in these talks? Yeah, there's a lot of deep scar tissue from legacy, and it's very uh, understandable. Um, you know, it dates back to Kyoto and even before. Then it followed with the climate bill and the hopes that were raised around that in Copenhagen. And so I think it's completely legitimate that countries have uh, a bit of a lasting legacy of those in, in how they view the United States. Uh, the reality is, you know, I think that, that this administration is now finally more engaged. You've got a Secretary of State who is talking about climate change in almost every single bilateral he has with leaders. Uh, he's driving, you know, and working on an agenda with China and with India, but clearly understands the importance of a multilateral agreement. And, uh, you know, I think that 
um, you know, it's obviously not the only thing that he does in his in his day, but um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, you know, beginning next year, that he sort of gets more personally engaged in how the U.S. brings forward what it can do in the 2015 agreement, and then sort of you know, throwing uh, everything that the United States has in helping to to shape and deliver on a, the most aggressive action possible. Mm. But, you know, all, each of these pieces come with uh, a bit of legacy. Every time the United States says something, uh, you know, it sort of leads to a kind of counter reaction sometimes. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the U.S. is still, you know, one of the world's largest economies, has a very big political impact in lots of countries around the world. And if the United States doesn't act on climate change, it has a damaging ripple effect. So what I hope we see over the next couple of months and years is that as the U.S does reduce emissions and as the U.S. does more action and less talking, that that will have the same sort of positive ripple effect so that more countries will feel confident in taking the, the next steps. Mm. I mean, you, you guys have a, um, a, a, a sizable, substantial team um, based in China, I think I'm right. What, what kind of impact do you think this um, growing, seemingly growing link between the USA and China relating to climate change um, is having? What, what, what can that achieve? Well, they're, they're obviously two of the world's largest emitters. Um, so what they do on climate change has a pretty big impact in terms of emissions. Obviously, uh, they have a big impact on the, the geopolitics of this issue as well. Um, you know, if you can get the sort of two big countries moving in the right direction, it makes things easier. Um, I don't think we'll have some sort of grand G2 alliance as some people uh, envision. Um, you know, I think that's a nice theory that, that's never uh, materialized. But what you're seeing, I think, between the U.S. and China is uh, a sort of engagement around how can they troubleshoot some issues that are collectively in their both in, you know, interests. So HFCs, the super greenhouse gas emissions, the Chinese have, uh, I think, realized that it's in their own domestic interest to deal with this and that they have companies in, in their country that are producing alternatives and deploying this. And so the U.S. engagement is less about telling China what to do and it's sort of helping cultivate the action on the ground that China already wants to do. And, you know, the, the big dynamic in, in China, uh, you know, and our team of 30 people is working quite actively on this is how do you uh, transition, you know, the coal? What kind of peak on coal do you have and how do you have a cap on coal? Uh, you know, it helps when the public is, you know, uh, rallying around the air pollution and the policymakers have to, to respond. Uh, there's nothing like, a, you know, uh, terrible air pollution days to sort of drive a, a debate in China. And so I think we're seeing a, a lot more traction in China about when uh, it can adopt a cap on its coal and what that means sort of on the ground in terms of policies. Mm. We've also seen some links between U.S. states uh, and China. I think California and China signed an agreement. What, what, what? What can you point to at state level that, that encourages you or that makes you think that um, there, is, there is more evidence of um, green growth in the USA? Lots happening on the states. Uh, you know, California is the world's seventh largest economy, so not an insignificant player in the world. And they have a, a very robust set of policies, uh, both the cap and trade, but also uh, a number of other complementary measures that are driving that. They have the most aggressive renewable standard in the, in the country, 33% uh, by uh, 2025. So it's a pretty aggressive standard. And across the U.S., we're seeing uh, just a huge uptick in terms of new deployment of renewable energies, which is mostly being driven by state level programs to mandate a certain share of electricity in, in the energy mix. And at the same time, you've got, I think, energy efficiency programs finally taking hold because many of the utilities are being forced to actually look at the best and smartest and most economic uh, investment and actually dedicate resources to that. And as we all know, energy efficiency is the kinds of energy that you know keeps paying for itself. And so the energy programs at the state level are really taking off to some extent. Okay, two, two quick ones uh, finally on this um, particular conference. Uh, loss and damage, climate compensation, any, any chance of any um, movement from the U.S. do you suspect on that? I think that there's a, a growing awareness of the need to deal with the impacts of climate change that are already happening now. 
how that gets sort of formalized in the, the climate uh, you know, agreement coming out of here um, is obviously a complicated issue. Um, the U.S. and other countries have sort of put out a marker, which is, you know, a sort of liability regime is a red line for us, and, and it's always hard to cross countries' red lines in these negotiations. That's, that's usually a sort of place to avoid. But I think there's a, a path forward in creating a new mechanism to address the real issues around loss and damage, which you know is reflected in you know the damages that are being caused by things like typhoons that are maybe you know uh, very difficult to adapt to in the future, but also for some of the small island states that are looking at the, the future of their country uh, being underwater in some sense, and, and I think that there's uh, a growing awareness of the need to deal with those legitimate issues uh, in a way that sort of gives countries a sense that they're that they're not being just sort of shoved to the side, and I think that there's some path forward on that, how that plays out in the next couple of days will obviously be critical as, as many of the uh, developing countries have made this kind of one of their top tier issues for, for the Warsaw COP. Mm. Okay, and finally, finance. Um, there's been a lot of work in the past year, particularly led um, by the USA on developing new sources, new flows of private finance, but um, can you see any new pledges being made by the US administration at this conference in terms of um, you know either adaptation or mitigation or, or you know whatever any 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 new funds, I, I think there might be some new um, commitments around the edges on forestry. Um, I think that the, there's clearly an interest in how uh, how these pieces pull together for next year and maybe the year after. So uh, I think there's a growing sense that they uh, that the U.S. needs to put some uh, you know specific proposals on the table. Uh, you know, and I think there's a huge opportunity there. There's uh, a lot of funding still going to some of the brown activities from the development banks and the export credit agencies. And if you stop funding overseas coal plants, you could actually turn a lot of that money to wind and solar that's, you know, starting to materialize across the world and, and how that sort of plays out. But it's probably too ripe. Uh, you know, it's not quite ripe enough at this point to actually have that done. But, you know, clearly driving towards the Banky Moon Summit in, you know, September of next year, that's a critical platform for countries to, to bring forward some of these ideas and, and see what we can do to put it forward.